so we're really, really looking forward to that. And I know you are too. We're going to have a great time together. Um, tonight, I want to talk with you, if the Lord would help me, about uh, passion and um, what it means to be passionate, uh, to live with passion. You have seen the bumper sticker that said, um, uh, a bad day fishing is, a, is better than a good day at the office. Obviously, someone who wrote that don't like their job. Amen. Or you might say, well, no, they just really love fishing. I've been studying a lot about passion in this last week, and um, I found out that people who are passionate um, about something, when you are passionate about something, matter of fact, John Maxwell, the great author, said, in fact, we listened to him a moment ago in our uh, 5 o'clock staff meeting, he talks about if you find something that you are so passionate about, something that you love so much that you would do for free, you get good enough at it, people pay you to do it, you never work a day in your life. You might not understand that. But it is a proven fact that, that people who are passionate about their jobs do a better job. Dr. Dave Martin said, because of the lack of passion... Many people have caught, I mean, we have cost thousands and thousands of dollars to our employers and to, co uh, you know, our companies because we spend so much time walking the halls. We spend so much time chit-chatting at the water fountain or out at the smoke break, whether you smoke or not. Amen? Uh, and that's a whole other discussion. But anyway... Um, and surfing the internet and the web because we're just trying to make 5 o'clock get here so we can clock out because of that drudgery called a job. And in fact, people really, they get up on Monday morning, they say things, man, it is old blue Monday, man, it's Monday, it is terrible. And then they finally get to Wednesday and say, it's hump day, we're halfway there. And they feel like if we can ever get to Friday and the whistle blows at 5 o'clock or whatever it is we get off, you know, then we can really live for about two days. And then we go back to the old grind. Man, you sure do hate your job. See, there's a difference in a job and work. When you're doing your life's work, in other words, when you find out what God has called you to do, did you know that the Bible said that he told Jeremiah, before I formed thee in your mother's belly, I knew you and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. God has a specific task and a specific purpose for every person that has ever been born. And when we're doing our life's work, when we're doing our life's task that God uh had us born for or created us for. You know what? He is the creator, and that's what gives us our creativity. And creativity expresses the passion we have. You take PJ. PJ is passionate about some things musically, and he expresses it well there on the drums. Are you with me? Say amen. And in singing or whatever. Adam has a passion to play the piano, and he just spells it out right there and, and in voice and in singing. Uh, Dex is another. Are y'all with me? Say amen. So people are passionate about what they do. Um, you take Aaron um, Hutto, our IT man. Some of you wouldn't know him if I were to bring him up on the stage. In fact, I told him the other day because he's doing all of our IT, and we're, we're about to do a, a big upgrade, a couple thousand dollars worth of because everything is so stinking slow and we got to get into this generation and all of that and he's working that matter of fact he's here now working behind the scenes with the server and so on and so forth I said to him the other day people might not even know who you are I'd have to get you a visitor's card if I brought you up on the stage because you work behind the scenes so much people say who is that Amen. But he's passionate about what he does. Now, you've got to have a stepladder to talk to him because he's talking in gigabits and megahertz and this and that and the other. And you might get hurt, and I don't know, just or bit or something because he just speaks that kind of language. And every now and then I just say, slow down, brother, and just tell me in terms I can understand. huh? Or just tell me how many dollars it's going to take to fix it, and we just sign the check, and you just go ahead and do <laughs> what you got to do. But what I'm saying, he has a passion to do that kind of stuff. A passion to make sure, uh, listen, if you try to do something out here at one of these iPads, he's got those things locked down like Fort Knox. Are you with me? We installed 
ten thermostats so we could control them from our cell phones anywhere. Like it had a meeting the other night, I'd be able to just get on my cell phones. They turn the admin wing on uh, and deviate from the schedule or whatever. But in order to do that, you got to have somebody that's passionate about IT that can set that up, or you ain't never gonna make that work. Amen. Some of you are passionate about what you do, and then others are just on a job. Y'all with me? Say amen. I just want to get through a little bit. I want you to understand something. Work was, was already in place before sin entered the picture. Did you know that? In Genesis chapter number 2 and verse 15, notice what the, the Bible says. He's talking to them in the garden, and he says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, I know because of sin that came, uh, you know, a little bit later, then the Bible says the Lord told him that in the sweat of your brow, you're going to till the earth, the ground, and the earth will not yield its strength, and that's part of the curse. I understand that. But what I wanted to show you was that his life's work had already been laid out before sin messed it all up and work got harder. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So the Lord had already said, I've given you a place to live and something to work at. Amen. Before sin ever entered the picture. And so what is your life work? What are you passionate about? I want to tell you something. When, when God called me to preach, I was a freshman in high school, and I ran from the Lord for five years. I finished, the, you know, the, the four grades of high school. One year for each, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. Then I got married 28 days after high school. Now, I'm not recommending that. I mean, it worked out for me. But it was a long, hard road to plow. When you get married that young, are you with me? Say amen. Now, I, I don't regret it. It's where I'm at, and God has really blessed me. Um, but so I put on my running shoes because God called me to preach in the ninth grade, and then he reassured me again. Uh, in the 11th grade, and I really put on my running shoes, and, you know, through tongues and interpretation and through prophecy and all of that, and God just really just hammered this thing home to me, and, and I knew it, but I took off running. And so I took my wife to, school, to work one day, and I joined the Air Force, and then I told her, I said, listen, I've joined the Air Force, and you did what while she was at work, and I, I don't recommend that either. That's not a way to do that. And uh, so anyway, I left, you know, and... Uh, I took the physical December the 29th of 1984, left April the 15th on tax day of 1985, and found myself in San Antonio, Texas, you know, rubbing a bald head saying, oh, man, what in the world have I done? Huh? But, but the Lord began to deal with me, and while he got me a long way away from people, I didn't know a living soul, didn't know anybody, but he got me a long way away. And, and there I had in my suitcase my Bible, and by the light of an exit sign at night, I just read the Bible, and the Lord just had six solid weeks with just me and him. And, you know, at night uh, and, and so forth, and he just really began to, to deal with me and about that call to ministry. And when I got, my dad had said, son, I'm praying that you get stationed at Moody Air Force Base there in Valdosta, Georgia. And I was like, man, I'm going to the Carolinas, Charleston Air Force Base, Seymour Johnson, uh, you know, somewhere on the, the East Coast, but not in my back door where I was raised. Are y'all with me? Say amen. Although Moody is three hours from home. I put down like Patrick and Homestead and McDeal and Tyndall and all of those Florida bases. Didn't get none of them. When they called my name that day, Saints Michael David, Moody Air Force Base, Georgia. I said, look at daddy go. You know? So uh, nonetheless... Moody was my very last choice on my dream sheet. I even had Robins before that. Anyway, nonetheless, there I am. And so, um, and, and long story short, God just began to deal with me, and, and I began reading the Bible and just really digging in, and the Lord reaffirmed me one night. It was Kelly was already in bed. It was just me and Jesus, and I was reading my Bible, and the Lord just, just addressed me very clearly, if I've ever heard from the Lord, he said, you're never going to be happy to I do, uh, until you do what I've called you to do. And I'm like, Lord, what are you talking about? He said, turn to Jeremiah chapter 1 and read it. And I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. I ain't got there yet, but if I get there and if it don't have anything to do with being called to preach the gospel, I'll never entertain that thought again in my life as long as I live. 
When I got there, Jeremiah said in verse 4, uh, you know, he said, Lord, I'm a child. I can't go. And the Lord says, don't say that I am a child, for thou shalt go, and thou shalt speak to all that I send thee. And he said, you know, I'm going to touch your lips and put my words in your mouth. Be not afraid of their faces. Don't be afraid of the people, et cetera, et cetera. And I was blown away. And that ignited a passion in me that I knew that God was confirming what he had already done several years earlier. And so there was a passion in me to preach the gospel. And I began to study, and I began to dig in, and I began to talk to old preachers that had been doing things a long time. And had some of them took me under their wing, and some of them told me, you ain't never going to be nothing, and the church of God ain't never going to give you no other opportunity. All they give me is run-down, raggedy churches. And I heard all of that. And I said, I'm not asking for nothing except an opportunity, period. But I was passionate about it. Let me, let me give you one story before I move on in this. The passion can be seen in this story. I took my first licensure test in 1987. And um, I went through ministerial internship and had to serve a year before you could take what is now the ordained test. And you only had a year from the time you applied because if you applied and a year, more than a year went by, that information was old and they made you renew it. So just in case, you know, you had gotten a divorce or something tragic had happened and they wanted it to be very current. So I was moving. I had just sold my house in Valdosta, Georgia. I, I got sent to Claxton, Georgia to pastor a little church there. And the state secretary called me and she said, Brother Michael, you're um, scheduled to test next week for, you know, the next rank of ministry, and if you don't test, since you missed the October or November testing, if you don't test here, then your application will be torn up, and I had already moved from Valdosta, and I was going to have to get a new district overseer to sign, all that stuff. She said, I would suggest that you get here next week. Now, let, let me tell you, I had used all the money I had, and it wasn't a whole lot, to move from Valdosta to, to uh, Claxton. On my way, the motor in the car blew up. Are you with me? Say amen. And so I'm making payments on a house that I no longer live in. I've taken on a car payment. I've just paid all my moving expenses. Didn't have sense enough to know that the, the state would have paid my moving expense. I just didn't know it. And then, and of course, I was proud, too, and I wasn't going to ask. And so, so I didn't have but $2 to my name. But she said, you got a test tomorrow. Now, that's a good two-hour drive from Claxton. So, you know what I did? I said, there's three-quarters of a tank of gas? Maybe, just maybe. If the Lord will really stretch this, I might get there and back. <laughs> so, I got in that car. I had $2 in my pocket. I drove all the way to Tifton, Georgia. I took the test, and I was thinking, I remember Brother Mike Cowart was the chairman of the licensing board, and he, the, my test was right here on the top, and it's about 10 minutes till 12, and it's time to go eat. And I'm thinking, just go ahead and grade that because I ain't got the money to go eat anyway. And, you know, he said, well, I'm going to just turn that over and it'll be right here when we get back from lunch. I was thinking, man, I don't want to go to lunch. I ain't got no money to buy no lunch. And so I had my $2. I needed to buy gas with the $2. Y'all with me? Say amen. But lunch came and I said, well, I don't know if I passed the test. Nothing, nothing leaves nothing. So let me get a honey bun and a cold drink or something. So that's what I did. And so on my way home, I get to Vidalia, Georgia. And, man, I'm talking about the hand is past the E. And the E don't stand for enough. <laughs> huh? And so I pulled into a shell station, and I had my old trusty MasterCard. Are you with me? Say amen. So I went out there, and this was back before the days where they made you actually make sure it went through and they paid for it before they let you pump it. So I pump about $10 worth, or 20 I can't remember. And I walked in there, and she ran that card through there. And she said, uh, I'm sorry, but it declined. I said, Lord, have mercy. But I'm telling you to say this, I was passionate. Uh, oh, I did pass the test. <laughs> and so I was on cloud nine because I passed that. And I was passionate about going there to do that, even if I only had $2. You know, and, and you say, well, he couldn't get his money from the church. church didn't have no money either. Amen. I mean, I went there to 36 people. And I got them down to about 18 in about six months. And so, I mean, we didn't have no money in the church. So, 
I said, I am so sorry. Let me go around to the bank here. And, you know, I didn't. nobody had a debit card back then. There was no such thing at that point. I said, but there was an ATM. I'll just get $20 out and come back and pay you. So I went around the corner to the bank, and I punched in my number, and that thing said, spit that little receipt out, insufficient funds. I said, man, you got to be kidding me. Let me try that thing again. It spit that same or another paper right back out, insufficient. I said, Lord Jesus. Now, I have drove all the way to Tifton on $2. That all I have was $2. I've took this test. I've passed this test. I've come back and done charged this gasoline, and my MasterCard said no go. And now my bank card said no go. Now, i got to walk back in here and tell this woman i got to come up with something. I don't know if I can fry some chicken in there or wash some dishes or something. But I walked in and I said, ma'am, I am as sorry as I can be. And I don't even think I told her I was a pastor because I was too embarrassed. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm saying that I had to make a deal with her because she, had, she held on to my driver's license while I went to the bank to try that. <laughs> well, I come back and she said, listen, uh, I, I said, hey, I live in Claxton. I will go there. I will bring the money back tomorrow. And uh, so she took all my information, tag number and all that, and it all worked out, and I went home, and somehow I scraped up the money, and I come back. I said that to say this. Uh, I mean, what you have to have some sort of driving passion to say, go take the next level of ministry, go do something to advance. You ain't got but $2 you and got to drive all the way across the state of Georgia. You with me? Say amen. But you got to do what you got to do. Passion is what drives people. Many people struggle from week to week to week. Cannot live. Just, just cannot get by. They have no passion. But I had some passion there. Listen, people that show up for work, that, that they hate their life, they hate their job. Let me say this. Here's a couple things that can happen. If you've got a vision of your life and whatever it is, you can hold on to that vision until one day you reach it, one day you achieve it, one day you attain it, or you can just lower your expectations of your vision and pull them down right here to what reality is right now. And I would suggest to you that many, many people would rather pull down their dream and pull down their vision and let it equal what their reality is right now rather than risk trying to go after something higher than where they are. Okay, so it's human nature to trade momentary comfort for a lifetime of regret and, and uh, temporary feelings for years of what-ifs. See, the tendency um, to make our reality match our dream, we would rather just Pull the dream down because we can't raise the reality. And here, here's why I want you to understand this. You hear me now when I say this. Abandoned dreams never abandon us. Let me explain. Abandoned dreams, dreams that we gave up on because somebody said, you won't never be that. You'll never make that. You'll never achieve or attain this level. Never, never, never. Because somebody whispered that and we listened to that over and over and over again. We finally abandoned what we were once passionate about or what's, what, what we had as a lofty goal. And when we abandoned that, the dream never abandons you. Every time you see a nurse, you say, I could have been a nurse. Every time you see a doctor or a lawyer, or a pastor, or whatever it is that, that you were hoping and uh, dreaming. See, when you were a kid, you sat in front of the TV and you saw a fire, and you said, one day I'm going to drive one of those trucks. One day I'm going to put out fires. One day I'm going to fly for Delta. One day I'm going to do this. And then, then you started listening to negative people and pessimistic people and people that tried and failed, and they told you and convinced you that you can't never do it. And so you abandoned your dream, but the dream never abandoned you. Because every time you see Delta take off on TV, you're thinking, man, I could have been flying that. I could have been the flight attendant. I could have done this or I could have. We abandon dreams, but they never abandon us. It'll play over and over and over, haunting us again and again and again. So let me ask you this. What is it that, uh, that you are passionate about? See, because it, it's a drudgery to do something that you hate doing. I talk to people all the time that say, Pastor, I hate my job. 
and I would quit, but I've got to feed my family. They would say, I hate what I do. I hate the hours. I hate the shifts. You know, I hate the employees. I hate the boss. And sometimes I even hate myself. But I've got to provide. I understand that to a great degree. I've done some jobs that I really wasn't proud of just because I was a daddy. Amen? I can remember where when I first went to Claxton, Georgia, I crossed traffic. I directed traffic down at the, the middle school, uh, the elementary school. I directed traffic down there for $50 a week. You know why? It made that $205 car payment because my car motor had blown up. Are you with me? Say amen. And I was a bailiff in Superior Court, and I did none. I, I enjoyed that. I was passionate about that. I enjoyed the courtroom experience. And then done some juvenile intake work. But I've done some, some hard work and took on some side jobs to do some things. I really wasn't passionate about pressure washing this big warehouse. But I had to do it because I owed some bills. Are you with me? Say amen. And all that comes down to priorities. When you get my priorities right, I don't have to do all that all the time. But let me, let me move on. Let me help you find out about some things you can be passionate about. First of all, uh, you know, if you want to find out what you're passionate about, you can keep a passion journal. In other words, you could just you could journal something every single day about what is it about today that really moved me. Journal that. There's another way you could do it. Um, Dr. Dave Martin said this. He said, you could go back and rent again your top five or six favorite movies of your whole life and take notes. What is it that really moved you about that movie? Why did you watch that movie again and again and again and again? And when you start identifying that, you start pointing toward what you're passionate about. And then there's another way you could ask people that you trust. Don't just get any old person to do this, but have them look at you and just evaluate honestly and say, what do you think I'm passionate about? And when you look at my life, what, what really moves me? And, you know, if you ask the right people, some, some competent people, those questions, you might can make some headway there. And then you can uh, list some moments in your own life that define you, some, some moments that just define you. Um, you know, positive ones and bad ones. Let me say this. In your life, you're going to experience positive things and negative things. Positive things are going to go through your mind. Negative things are going to go through your mind. Let me just suggest something to you. Feed the positive things in your life, and they will grow. Starve the negative things in your life, and they will die. Amen. So, and, and then something else you've got to do is if you're trying to make a dream come true, hang out with some people that have done it. If you constantly hang out, let, let me say this, you'll never fly with eagles hanging out with turkeys. I'm going to let that one soak in for a minute. You ain't never going to fly with eagles running with turkeys. Say, now, Pastor, you meddling a little bit. Let me just say this. Your closest five friends, get them, f figure them out, and you will be the average of them. You'll be the average of their income. You'll be the average of their status. I mean, I'm, I'm just talking about some facts that's, that give or take just a little bit, you'll be the average of your five closest friends. So guess what? Some of y'all need to hang out with some uh, more successful people. Just let that stay right there. <laughs> so listen, wh why, why am I not chasing what I believe my God-given dream and what I'm passionate about? I'm going to tell you the primary reason is fear. The primary reason is fear is it is a deterrent. Then there's another reason. It's called self-doubt. Did you know there are many, many people, and, and just look straight ahead right here because um, people think you're looking at them for a certain reason. There are those people who believe in others but cannot believe in themselves. They'll look at Adam and say, oh, man, you could do it. You, you, you could cut a record. You could do it. They look at someone else and say, oh, Pastor, man, Pastor Saints, he could do it, man. He could be the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Oh, Lord, I really need to uh, get baptized every day. Are y'all with me? Say amen. But, uh, man, oh, yeah, he could do it, but you can't even believe for the man standing in the mirror looking at yourself. Now, I don't have that problem. You say, no, wait a minute, that's a little bit cocky, in it? No, no, no. I do have confidence that I can do whatever I set my hand to do. If God be with me, I believe I can do it. 
I ain't saying it's going to be easy, I, but I believe I can do it. And, and you ain't going to have to worry about me, um, you know, saying, well, I don't even think I'm going to try it. No, I'll try. The next thing that kills our passion and our dreams is often is disbelief. Uh, we just can't believe that we could possibly do that. And then there's another thing. It's called a limited view of life. There are those who right now look around, and you can't see life any better than the way it is right now. You can't see yourself ever making more than thirty or $40,000 a year or whatever it is. You know, it may be more, maybe less, but that's where you're at. And, and you can't see yourself ever owning a, another home or a nicer place or a better vehicle or, or even being out of debt. You just, you're just locked in that I'm just going to do this until one day the sun don't come up no more. So remember, abandoned dreams never abandon us. And then there's those who are addicted to personal comfort. This is the person here, watch this. You have achieved a level of success, uh, maybe make a come, and that level of comfort is what keeps you from reaching for anything greater than. The fear of losing what I have. You know, some of y'all watch the game shows. You know how the game shows, they always, it always happens where they say, you got a million dollars over here. Now listen, brother, you have already won 129000 But if you'll lay it all on the line right now, lay it all on the line, roll the dice one more time, you could be a millionaire. And man, he's shaking and thinking and, you know, his wife is shaking and they don't know what in the world to do. And most often, or I ain't saying most often times, but a lot of times there are those who will say, you know what, I'm going to walk out of here with this 129000 right now for the guaranteed deal. And I'm not saying it's a bad deal. I'm just trying to show you that there are those who say, let me just take what I got, let me live with what I am and who I am and the level of success I've got because what if I do try and fail? Well, let me tell you what will try. What will happen if you try and fail? You'll know one way that won't work. And then you can try something else. Huh? Failure is not falling down. Failure is staying down. So uh, let, me, let me go a little bit further with this before I uh, read a little scripture here. <clears throat> I posted something on Facebook uh, the other day, yesterday. I don't know if you read it or not. It simply said, and it, and it was um, uh, Pastor Dave Martin that said this. He said, moving towards something significant always requires moving away from something familiar. <laughs> That's good stuff. It is scary stuff, ain't it? Moving towards something significant always requires moving away from something familiar. When we got ready to build this place, hey man, I was 44 years old at the old church. We had decent income, we didn't owe nobody nothing. I could just be fat, dumb, and happy, so to speak, just preach a decent message, just have a decent youth group, just have a decent, you know, don't ripple anything, don't, work, don't muddy the waters, just sort of draw your check and live out the next 25 years or so. But I refuse to live with that mentality that God put me on planet Earth to make a difference and not just sit here and tread water until he comes to get me. Now, I don't know about you, that might not going to be you, but that is me. Listen, God gave me a passion, and so I had to leave something familiar, which was that church, that building, that salary, that, that place. Leave something familiar to go towards something significant, and it did not happen overnight. And there's a lot of hard knocks along the way, and it was scary, and it was bumpy, and 12 families walked away during that tr process. Are y'all hearing me say Amen. Caused me to lose the rest of the hair that I had not lost at the time. But nonetheless, moving towards something significant and away from something familiar. So, listen, here's the deal. Most people are not willing to do that. They're not willing to do that. So they would rather say, I'll live it out right here where I'm at. I'm good. I'm good with this. See, um... Fruit is never intended for the tree that bore it. Are you with me? I, I want to tell you something. Whatever it is, the God-given work for your life, the passion that for your life, whatever my life work, it's not for me. 
My passion is, is preaching the gospel and teaching the gospel and, and, and these things. And that gift is not for me, it's for others. You see, the tree does not enjoy the fruit that hangs from the vines. The passerbys that wander underneath reach up and grab the fruit. And so whatever God has for your life work, it's not really for you. I mean, it's going to bless you because when you see others blessed, you are indeed blessed. But it's, it, it's about other people. You see, passion is what will push you ahead of your time and free you from conventional thinking. You know what's so different about our church? A lot of people say, man, them people are crazy. I mean, matter of fact, Lisa told me, <laughs> uh, she said, man, first time I walked in here, man, ain't no way in the world I'm staying here. <laughs> she said, I wasn't raised in this now. <laughs> it was quiet in the church. <laughs> them people lost it. And now she's up on the stage acting like a fool with us. Are y'all with me? Say Amen. Right here with us. Why? Because you get passionate about it. What is it that makes you drive every week from uh, Nahuna or Jacksonville or Brunswick or whatever when you get passionate and fired up about something? I want to tell you something, friends. Listen, I know we have jobs to do outside, but what we do for the kingdom of God is the only thing that is going to last in eternity. So, uh, you see, I want you to understand something. Passion is the catalyst of action or for action and innovation. It is the force behind the people that are always making it happen. You look at people. I remember I used to look at preachers. I say, man, my Lord, it's always like he's 14 steps ahead of me. I don't care. I could have some success, but, man, they're killing it over there. And I look around now, and I have a lot of pastors. I had one call me just yesterday. Uh, no, today. Today, pastor. I got to get with you. We got to talk about this thing. My church is starting to grow, and I ain't never seen this. You know, we're just about to break 200 with some consistency. And, um, you know, but you know what? They see They see a passion. And, and listen, I've been doing this a long time. I don't know why in the world everything started blowing up. Well, I do know why. It has to do with church systems. It has to do with uh, finally trying to figure some things out that, you know, because for years and years and years, someone would get saved and say, well, praise God. Glad they got saved. We won't see them again for five years, you know, or ten years away. you got to hold on to those people. you got to plug them into ministry. you got to keep up with them somehow. And if you don't, you're just you know, hauling water to the sea. Anyway, let me move on. I want you to understand something. I'm going to say this, and then I want to tell you a little story about Elijah. Man, where's time going? Hope you all enjoying this as much as me. How many of you know the Bible says, do not despise the day of small things? How many of you know what a mustard seed is? A mustard seed is, I mean, it is so tiny, you can't even hardly see it. But the Bible says when, it, when it's put in the ground, it grows up, birds come and light in it and nest. Are you with me? Um, small things. And um, I want you to understand, the, the larger your dream, the longer the period of gestation. I've got some lofty dreams for next year. Are you with me? Say amen. And today I was dreaming, and <laughs> I got back to the staff meeting, and Adam and Josh said, Pastor, what is all this you're talking about, <laughs> which is for next year? And they said, we ain't got a clue. I said, don't worry about it, but uh, that's some vision. That's some dreaming stuff. It's going to happen next year. But I just want you all to be ready because we're going to have to work the rest of this year to make that happen then. Are you with me? Say amen. <laughs> but let, let me help you with this. Think about the gestation period of an elephant, 22 months. That of a hamster is 16 days. Now, I know if Kelly was in here, she would say, roll tide because of elephants. Anyway, I, I'm just simply saying an elephant is a big animal. Huh? Long gestation period. 22 months, almost two full years in gestation and in, in getting ready to be birthed. Hamster, 16 days. Little runt, aggravating, run that wheel. I mean, just going nowhere. And as many hamsters, Lord Jesus, I didn't even look for that illustration. But you know what? That hamster run that wheel 900 miles, ain't went nowhere. Looking at the same scenery. <laughs> Nothing's changed. And, and so here's what I want to say. I want you to be passionate about something. I'll tell you a story real quick. It comes out of 2 Kings chapter number 2. A fellow by the name of Elijah, probably know him, one of the greatest of all the prophets of old. The Bible says in 
in the NIV in 2 Kings 2, and um, he said, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha, Elisha was his protege, Elisha was the contemporary, the one that Elijah went by his farm one day and threw his mantle upon him. And the Bible says, basically, Elisha answered the call to preach, and he said, I'll come with you today. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and you know what he did? He broke the plow and burnt the plow. He burnt the plow up. He went in and told his mom and daddy that he was leaving, and he slaughtered the oxen that he was plowing with, and he had a big feast and said, I'm going away. Let me say this. You know what I'm saying is ministry, he said, now is my passion. I'm not coming back to plow, and I don't got plan B and plan C. That's over with. That's gone. Everything I have and the rest of my life will be a passion for the man of God and for serving him, and one day I will take his place. Let me, let me read to you. So Elisha, or Elijah said to Elisha, he said to Elisha, the older said to the younger, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel, he says. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. So they went together. Now, you got to understand, Elisha knew that something was about to happen. Verse 3, the company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked him, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Elisha says, listen, I know in my gut something is going to happen today. And he ain't telling me to stay nowhere. Where he goes, I am going. I ain't sitting down here while he goes to Bethel. Watch this, verse 4. Elijah said to him, stay here, Elisha. The Lord has sent me to Jericho. He replied, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the company of the prophets at Jericho went up to Elisha and they asked him, do you know that the Lord's going to take your master from you today? And he replied, yes, I know it, so be quiet. Then Elijah said to him, stay here, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you live, I'll not leave you. So the two of them walked on, headed to Jordan. Are you with me? Say amen. I submit to you that Elisha was passionate about his calling. He had already burnt the plow and slaughtered the oxen. He wasn't going back to plowing. He said, I'm going to go wherever I have to go, but I'm going to be beside the man of God. Let me go on. So, verse 7, 50 men from the company of the prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and he struck the water with it and the water divided to the right and to the left and two of them crossed on dry ground. That's pretty serious stuff. When they crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me now what I can do for you before I'm taken from you. See, I would say to you that Elijah was testing Elisha. That this was a test to see if he would stay in Bethel, to see if he would stay in Jericho or push on toward Jordan. Let me go on. He says, um, the answer from Elisha is this, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit, Elisha replied. Notice verse 10, you have asked a difficult thing, Elijah said. You have asked a difficult thing. Now, I want you to understand, he didn't say an impossible thing. Yet, if you see me when I'm taken from you. See, here again, what he's saying is, I'm testing you. I want to see if you are passionate enough to go with me to the ends of the earth, wherever it is. If you see me when I'm taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise, it will not be. And um, as they were walking and talking together, suddenly, a chariot of fire and the horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. How about this? Elisha saw this, and he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more, and he took hold of the garment and tore it in two. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan, the same place where he stood before when Elijah done it. Fifty men were watching him. Watch this. This is good stuff. 
He said, he took the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and he struck the water. Where is now the Lord God of Elijah? He asked. And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left. And he crossed over. Isn't this something? Hang on. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, they're still right there. They've had, it's been in their purview when they went over the river and it opened. And then he got there and all of a sudden a chariot of fire came, separated the two of them, took Elijah to heaven in a whirlwind. The, the mantle's falling back down. He catches it because he sees him when he goes. He runs back to the same place and says, where's the Lord God of Elijah? And it opens up again. And he walks back the other way. What's this? He's walking in this passion now. The company of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said the spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Look, they said, we, your servants, have 50 able men. Let them go and look for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has picked him up and set him down on some other mountain or in some valley. Did you ever catch that? What's this? No, Elisha replied, do not send them. But they persisted until he was too embarrassed to refuse. So he said, okay, send them. And they sent the 50 men who searched for three days but did not find him. When they returned to Elisha, who was staying in Jericho, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? That is the picture of a man filled with passion living with passion. I want to tell you something as you stand with me. You were born for something great. God didn't make any trash. You were born for something and you need to find what that passion is and pursue it with everything in you. I know um, Sister Pat, I don't know if she's here tonight, but Sister McCutcheon, she, she loves the uh, working with the crisis pregnancy, uh, the care net there uh, because of, you know, the girls that come there, the women that come there that uh, find themselves in this condition, whether intentionally or not, and, and, but she feels like she can make a difference, and a difference she's making, passionate about it, and I don't know what it is, whether it's a passion to, to counsel, whether it's a passion to coach, or to mentor, or to teach, or to nurse, or to doctor, or, or to lead, whatever it is. But I know that God has a passion for every one of us. And when we are operating in our passion, that's, that's how we can work long, tough, arduous hours. I'm not saying you don't need a break. You do. Someone says, well, man, you ought to have seen this place for the two or three weeks prior to Easter. Man, it is crazy around here. We work some very long, long days. But you know what? I don't know anything in this world I would rather be doing than preparing for Easter Sunday. Amen? Find what you're passionate about. Let's pray. Lord, I just love you. I pray, God, for these people that are here tonight, that they would be overtaken by passion. Lord, that they would identify that in their heart, Lord, that they are truly passionate about and go after it and not let any of the hindrances of self-doubt and fear and, and um, um, even recent successes and uh, the comfort of, of where they are now, not to allow anything to stop them because abandoned dreams never abandon us. May we live with that thought in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, invite your friends for the message series, Built to Last. If you know somebody who's struggling in their marriage, they need to be here this Sunday. God bless you.